Your blessings amid a joyous world. A week from today, something very special is going to happen in Poland. They're going to dedicate their new branch facilities there, about 10 miles south of Warsaw. Frankly, this is a milestone. This is the first of a chain of branches being scheduled to be built and dedicated for what used to be the communist nations under the Soviet Union. So brothers in Poland are going to be very excited, and they are excited right now because many of them are prepared for that dedication program. It may be of interest to you to, you to know that the society is building, renovating, and remodeling in over 72 nations of the earth. And these branches bring a blessing and a far cry from what used to be in those nations that once were occupied by just little huts where the brothers who were left to go to serve there served in homes and rented facilities. And our talk today draws to our attention the blessings that come our way. We're asked to cherish our blessings amid a joyous, joyless world. And as God's people, we should ask ourselves, are we being called upon to count our blessings? Yes. And of course, it is a joyless world. And for example, just recently in the United States won the dubious distinction of being the most violent nation in the industrial world. We brothers live here. We live amidst people and in this nation, but we are no part of it, no part of its religious, political, and commercial, and military adventures. Our neutrality has not only proved to be a protection to us, but a salvation to us in many parts of the earth. It is a singular blessing if we only understand and appreciate it. Does that make us happy, brothers, that we're a part of an organization that is apart from all of this prime and all of this beyond on the face of this earth? And if we're happy, you might know that you haven't seen anything yet because as the Bible says, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the knowing of Jehovah even as the waters cover the sea. The kingdom will take possession of the earth whether we want it to or not or anybody else wants it to or not because that is the promise of God. So we're called upon to count our blessings at Malachi 3.10, we read, Bring all the parts into the storehouse that there may come to be a flood in my house. And test me out, please, in this respect. Jehovah Barnes has said, Whether I shall not open to you people the floodgates of heaven and actually empty upon you a blessing until there's no more want. Do we do this personally? Really reach out to God for a blessing and even test Him out. Do we do this personally and collectively? Do we call upon God to bless us so that we can in turn be a blessing to others? So Jehovah says to us, bring to Him all your wholehearted devotion, your total dedication, and for you not to fear because he will care for you. In fact, he calls upon us to test him out in this respect. He says, test me out, please, that I might pour upon you a blessing. God literally pleads with us so that he can pour out 
the very blessings of heaven upon us. And are we doing this? Are we counting our blessings? Are we appealing to God for even greater blessings that have been poured upon us? The anointed Jehovah has been doing this for years. And the old Jehovah has filled his house with glory, with his goodness. He has made his foots too glorious. The other sheep are the very blessing of Jehovah that we do see. <clears throat> Imagine four million, two hundred seventy-eight thousand, a hundred twenty-seven thousand brothers on the face of the earth, and most of these are of the other sheep. We never imagined so many in God's organization in our wildest dream, really, brother. We were happy in the thousands, and we held our breath at the hundreds of thousands, and lo and behold, when we reached into the millions, nobody began to believe it. And then they began to compound themselves into two, four, and now we're moving onward to five million. And the truth is, today there are more than a billion, 24 million hours preach to people on, in a single year. 11,431,171 people attended the memorial last year. And it shows the interest and the possibility of growth in Jehovah's organization. The anointed have reached out and begged God for a blessing. Now it's your turn, you other sheep. It's your turn to reach out and to learn how to call upon God. And as he tells you in the book of Malachi, test me out, please. He wishes for us to really throw ourselves as a young child would into the arms of a father, run and leap into his armor, in his arms and say, Daddy, I love you, I care for you, I trust you. That is what God wants us to do, to put ourselves completely into his hands and into his, thr into his trust will we do that. The Apostle Paul speaking, but we desire each one of you to show the same, the same industriousness so as to have the full assurance of the hope down to the end, in order that you may not become sluggish, because, but be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. If we are reaching out to God to bless us, are we being industrious about this and about his will. Are we imitators of those who inherit the promises? What are these promises? The Apostle Peter speaks very plainly to us about the promises. During this last presidential election, people were crying out for an alternative to government. They wanted to see a new approach in government, and they didn't see it in Ross Perot or Clinton or even Bush. But the fact of the matter, what could be more a dynamic alternative than that, than that which is presented to us at 2 Peter 3, 13, where we read, but there is a new heavens and a new earth that we are awaiting according to his promise, and in these righteousness is to dwell. The promise of the kingdom is what keeps our hope alive. It, it is what keeps us moving forward. We've got to ask ourselves, are we living for the kingdom of God? It's God's kingdom that keeps us focused in the right direction. Are we happy about this? Are we counting this as a blessing in our life? Do we see it as a blessing? Now these promised blessings are something, not something for us to enjoy temporarily. They are to be enjoyed 
in perfection forever. In fact, it was Jesus that so aptly said at Mark 10, 29 and 30, Truly says I say to you men, no one that has left houses or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake or for the sake of the good news who will not get a hundredfold now in this period of time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and fields with persecutions but in the coming system of things everlasting life now this promised blessing of Jesus is fulfilled even now in a hundredfold ways of cherished relationships in an abundant amount of spiritual provisions that we receive today. God's people feel these blessings now. They do. We were down in Colombia at Bogota's dedication two weeks ago, frankly, and it was a, a marvelous blessing to be there to see these people at the dedication of their new facility. It was a huge place, I think, oh, I'd say 50 or more acres of land, and around it a 10-foot cement fence that they had built. It had taken them five years to build that fence. Well, that's common in, in Colombia. Everyone has a fence around his property, but this is a cement fence, a beautiful thing that they have built, if you can call a fence beautiful. But the properties in themselves are outstanding. They were built by the International Construction Organization of Jehovah's Witnesses. So people came from all parts of the world to do their bit in the building of this branch. Here it is, the residential home housing more than 200 people. There is the office structure there to con control the offices and conduct the work there, a brand new kingdom hall, an assembly, not only assembly hall, but a dining hall that can seat over a thousand five hundred people, the kitchen, the garage there, a factory with presses in it. All of that was built, built within a five year period of time. Marvelous. Those people felt it a gigantic blessing to them. It was something that they couldn't do by themselves. But the whole organization came there to help them do it. This is what we see a marvelous thing happening on the face of the earth today. Missionaries that have been there, hundreds of them during these past years, came to this dedication. And when they saw each other, you ought to see the explosion of joy erupt among them. Tears of joy, hugging, kissing, and the mothers called it a day in paradise. And you can't imagine what thrill it was because some of them they haven't seen for years because they came from the States, from Europe, and all over the continent and the world came in for that dedication. And some of them likened it to meeting the dead after Armageddon and when the dead are being raised because of the many years of not seeing people, then suddenly seeing these who once were young having gray hair or no hair <laughs> and being able to welcome and squeeze them and kiss them to see them alive and functioning. Yes, when you talk about counting blessings, life is a blessing. We couldn't live a second without the help of God, preparing the oxygen, sunshine, day rotation, you name all the things that keep us alive. Yes, here we are, not only living, but we're enjoying things at the hand of God. Do we count these blessings? Are we grateful, grateful to be alive? Do we wake up in the morning thanking God that here's another day to live. We ought to, brothers, because we not only had a chance to live for three score and ten or four score years, there is an eternity out there for us. 
In fact, Jesus is the one who said this, and it is a remarkable statement because there he is in front of the people, and he says simply, He that believes has. He puts it in the present tense, guaranteed to him, has everlasting life because of the ransom sacrifice being paid in our behalf. That God will not forget those who have served Him. They have guaranteed to them life. So when you get up in the morning like you do in these imperfect bodies and don't feel so good, just think of the word of Jesus that you have guaranteed to you everlasting life at the hands of God. For God so loved the world that He gave his only begotten Son, and everyone exercising faith in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Our problem is, brothers, we take too many things for granted. We take life for granted as if God owns us something. But don't take it for granted. Realize everything comes at a sacrifice. And it'd be nice for us to respond with appreciation and gratefulness and appreciate life that we have at the hands of God. And to perpetuate this life, to build us up spiritually and to protect us, Jehovah, by means of his organization, has given us spiritual provisions and he's given us so much that truly we can't consume it all. <laughs> Frankly, we find it difficult to keep up with the spiritual provisions that are being provided almost daily for us, if not daily, by way of meetings, the Watchtower Awake magazine, the brochures, books, and booklets that have inundated us in recent times to be truthful. We find we, it is hard to find time and energy to study all the things that come our way. I don't think that we at Bethel are unique in this respect. I remember one time being in San Francisco. I gave a talk on the platform. It was at the district assembly. And if you know anything about giving talks before people, it's no easy matter, you know. You get all rung out. When I was finished with the talk, I was happy to walk off the platform. And a brother stopped me and he said, there's a group out here that want you to talk to them. I said, what group? And he said, there's a group of district and circuit overseers. And I said, the one on earth, would they have to say to me, what do, what's this urgent matter? He says, I don't know. So he brought me into another hall and there they were. A whole slew of them <laughs> with their wives. And I said, brothers, I have just finished talking for over an hour, please. They said, we have only one question to ask you. Where do you find the time to read all the publications of the society and to prepare these talks and to attend meetings and do all the traveling that you have to do? Yes, brothers, you alone are not being stressed out. These brothers out there in the forefront of the world find it difficult. They have to find the time to study, to be on top, and to be in front of all the things that are demanded of them. Not only you, they are there too. And I told them, if it were for the fact that I had the same problem as they did, and I had to work it out, I would be ashamed to come up and be, try to talk to them about this subject. The truth of the matter, I said, the only way that I have found to keep up with the things that we have today to study is by waking up early in the morning. I wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning, get out of the way of my wife. <laughs> she has the bathroom then takes her a little longer to put on her face and everything else. <laughs> but lo and behold, I go downstairs then. I am rested in my body and I am rested in my mind. 
And I find that then I sit in the dining room, I have a collection of literature in front of me, and I study. And I mumble and talk to myself, reach out in prayer, and I ask, what are the things I should know for today? And then you'd be surprised. It keeps me on top and in front and away from embarrassing questions. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful experience. It costs us little, but to wake up a little earlier and to create a decent habit in our life and sense the urgency and the need. Because we all have the spiritual need to know just what is the organization saying to us. What is the direction coming our way? The district and circuit overseers wanted it. We want it. Since this privilege being extended to you, count your blessings brothers, to think that you're in an organization that cares for you. There's a vivid spiritual contrast between our situation and that of the people of the outside world, people of the outside of Jehovah's favor. My, when you stop to think about them, you wonder about them. We have an abundant spiritual provision. What do those outside of God's organization get spiritually? I would wonder that. Frankly, before coming into the truth, I never stepped inside of a church. After coming in, in the truth and going on these sightseeing adventures, I've been in more churches than I don't know who in my life. And every time we go into these places, we search out the tetragrammaton or something of that nature. And right now I find in myself my own soul rebelling because you learn little by going inside of those places. Architecturally, they are an amazement to the eye as much as the Temple of Jerusalem was to Jesus. And when the disciples of Jesus called attention to the beautiful stones of the structure of the temple and Jesus simply said, I tell you, one of these days, and not too long from now, not one stone upon another will be standing here. It'll be like a cloud field. Primarily because of what is going on in the inside of those buildings by the people. The stones mean little or nothing, but when they are housing a den of thieves and everything else you can see, possibly think of that as unwholesome, then that building does not deserve to stand. David Stiven of the Gordon United Church in British Columbia, in his pastoral letter, said this, sometimes it is not thought to be, to be the done thing. That's the modern lingo, how to speak when some of these pastors are with it. I mean, the dumb thing for ministers to preach about money. Tut, tut, he says. But I firmly believe that it is the duty of a good shepherd to shear the sheep as well as to lead and to feed them. <laughs> That's a quotation. Believe me, they believe in money. <laughs> Lots of it. It, is reminded, it reminds us of the experience of a woman who was a longtime church builder. She started studying the Bible with Jehovah's Witnesses, and she was surprised to find God's name and that it was found so frequently in the Bible. And so she went to her minister and asked him, How is it? that I can be a member of your church for so many years and do not know the name of God and do not even know that the name of God appears in the Bible so many times. The pastor replied, Well, it's really not that important after all, is it? What's there in the name? She said, Well, it is important to me 
And I would like for you to take my name off the enrollment. <laughs> and he said, all right. But you have been keeping, you have not been keeping up with your dues. So once you pay back all your dues, I will remove your name. He asked, can I send you a check? Sure, he said, send a check. A few days later, she got a call from the minister, thanking her for the check. Just one thing, he said, you forgot to sign it. <laughs> and her reply, yes, I know, but what's there in the name? <laughs> Maybe he learned and maybe he didn't, but there's an awful lot in the name. The name of the living God, it's amazing how many people come into the truth by just knowing that God has a name. A number of years ago, a Presbyterian minister, Ernest Marvin, wrote concerning churches in England. It is no use thinking that we are or can tinker with the structures of the church as it has developed or failed to develop over the centuries. The church is dying. The pity is that before her final spasm, <laughs> she will have had more needless time, talent, and money spent on trying to keep her alive. Far from the church being a sign and a foretaste of the kingdom, she is more akin and a sign and foretaste of death from which there is no resurrection. From a clergyman. That certainly is not the way those taking the lead in Jehovah's organization are sounding. I hope not. We have life. We have increase. We have a vibrancy in Jehovah's organization that we ought to be in and feel proud of. We ought to feel it in our bones enough to count our blessings to be associated with Jehovah's organization. Jesus said that the blessings are ahead, are ahead of us in the coming system of things. He says, you might have persecution now, but you're going to have a hundredfold of brothers and sisters and mothers and houses and lands. But in the world to come, he says, but along the lands, he says, and persecutions will become everlasting life. A vivid spiritual contrast was foretold for us by the prophets of God, Isaiah 65, 13, and 14. They write poetically, and yet rather beautifully for us to see the contrast between the old and the new, the one that is on its way out, and the one coming in to occupy the face of the earth for all eternity under the kingdom of God. Isaiah 65, 13, and 14, therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord Jehovah has said. Look, my own servants will eat. Notice he identifies himself as his people. My own servants will eat, but you yourself will go hungry. Look, my own servants will drink, but you yourself will go thirsty. Look, my own servants will rejoice but you yourself will suffer shame. Look, my own servants will cry out joyfully because of the good condition of the heart. But you yourself will make outcries because, because of the pain of heart, and you will howl because of sheer breakdown of spirit. While we enjoy a spiritual feast, world of mankind, and especially so in Christendom, is experiencing a spiritual famine. They get nothing, brothers. They really get fleeced and skinned and knocked about, and they get nothing in return. 
they get marched on into war and into abortion and all kinds of decays. And today, the Catholic Church has come out with a new catechism encouraging its people to be more lenient toward homosexuals and lesbians. Right now, it's very doubtful that even the Pope of Rome believes in a hellfire anymore or anything of that nature. Of course, because there isn't any, but it's still in their catechism. Since the people of the world, and especially so in Christendom, are experiencing a spiritual famine and are in darkness, it causes them to be joyless and gloomy. What is the sense of being gloomy? You see it on the faces of the people. And the truth of the matter is, this year when we went into St. Petersburg, we saw this gloom and this doom that is so prevalent throughout all Christendom. I, I must tell you, it was rather shocking because St. Petersburg is really a rather beautiful city built by Peter the Great on canals. He would have been copied it after the Venice of Italy, but in the shape more of Paris of France. There are beautiful structures. I don't think the communist government did a sin, single thing since speak to the great boat boat building. Didn't touch them because they're all run down. The streets are, they beg for repairs. The streetcar tracks are way above because the water and everything else have worn out. And they have no finances to take care of these places. And the churches have been closed down. They've become dens. Now they're trying to open them up for tourists to come and to look at them and to gain some finances. But the truth of the matter was our greatest shocking experience was to go on the streets of St. Petersburg and meet the people of Russia face to face. And something shocking is that those people don't smile. They don't laugh. You don't see the hugging and the squeezing and the shouting and the joyful outcry that you see among Jehovah's people. Here Jehovah brought in, my goodness, 30,000 and more of Jehovah's Witnesses into St. Petersburg. And when we as a group blocked the streets and the thoroughfares of St. Petersburg, people stood and stared at us. They not only stared to look at the goods or how well we were dressed, but the fact that we were smiling and rejoicing and laughing and they said, what is there to laugh about? What is the joy that you people have? And we had handbills, over a million of them, that we passed out to these people and hoped that they would attend our convention. It is, if you ever wanted to see a contrast, you saw it there. And it was a bold contrast, really. And if we've ever had a reason to count our blessing, it was there. There right before our eyes, brothers, how proud we should be. Jehovah has given us a reason to live and to be alive and a hope and a direction and have an organization that is concerned not only about, about us oldies, but about the young people too. Jehovah's people. At Bethel, you ought to realize how much concern we have for you young children out there because we realize how desperate the world is after you. Us olders, they, they don't know much how what to do with us. They don't even know where to put us anymore. <laughs> but you kids, you represent the presidents and the governors and the mayors and the thrust of the future. And when they look upon you young Jehovah's Witnesses, believe me, we get calls at Bethel every day begging us to tell them, is any one of your people leaving today? We would like to hire them. We like to call them because they can't find people that they can trust with finances and with property and things of that nature anymore. They want Jehovah's Witnesses to be among them. They know 
that we can be trustworthy. In fact, in Canada, one of the great ship owners, I would use this name, but it's better perhaps not to, <laughs> hires Jehovah's Witnesses to watch over his property and to conduct his business and look at his money and his books because there's nowhere else to go. It's marvelous to know it. I know the brother personally that does that sort of thing. And so, brothers, sit there, gloat if you will, shout with joy, count your blessings, rejoice that you know the living God, Jehovah, and have a sense of everlastingness in you. We have something really to be proud of, only if we realize it. Meditating on Jehovah's dealings and blessing helps us to maintain a high level of appreciation, never taking what has been done or is God is doing or will yet do for granted. We in America, we have so many things, whether it belongs to us or not, whether it's all borrowed money or not. But the truth of the matter is, the United States is in a terrible debt and in a terrible economic state. Everybody would have goose pimples on them they knew how fast things are, really. But the truth is, we are not aware of this. Most of these things are hid from our sight. We have learned to live deceiving ourselves, laughing when we should be crying, and walking with our heads up when they should be bowed. But we of God's people, we have reasons to rejoice because we are not part of this system of things that we have hope for the future and we know, we know with all positiveness, with an absoluteness, that the kingdom is the hope of all mankind. There is no other hope on the face of the earth. As we do this, meditating and counting our blessings, our determination should be one to keep on serving our God Jehovah and to reinforce our faith, to build ourselves up, to give ourselves a good foundation and a direction. Joshua was the leader there, God's servant in Israel. He appealed to the elders of Israel on the basis of God dealing with them. Obviously, he had often meditated on what Jehovah had done in behalf of them as individuals and as a nation. Now, notice what is said. He had meditated on what God had done to them as a people before they became a nation and then after they became a nation. And it would be good for us, brothers, good for us to use our minds and our hearts and to reflect back over the past hundred years or so, to realize out of what we have come, to where we have come, and what we have, and then count our blessings, realize that we have really a cherished organization on the face of the earth. Joshua 24, 1 to 13, the society says it'd be good for you to take your Bibles and follow along with the reading of these 13 verses and more. Joshua 24, 1 to 13, and Joshua proceeded to assemble all the tribes of Israel together at Shechem, and he called the older men of Israel and its heads and its judges and its officers. And they went, taking their stand before the true God. So evidently there was an organized arrangement. Joshua and then the state of these men who had responsibility. And then behind them, the people, male and female, with their little ones, to hear what he had to say. And Joshua went on to say to all the people, 
This is what Jehovah, the God of Israel, has said. It was on the other side of the river, the river of Euphrates River, on the other side of the river that your forefathers dwelt a long time ago. Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they used to serve other gods. They were not worshippers of Jehovah. When they came westward, they came leaving their gods behind. Notice how he continues there. In time, I, I took your forefather. Now he puts it into the first person, God speaking. I took your forefather, Abraham, from the other side of the river and had him walk through all the land of Canaan and made his seed many. So I gave him Isaac. Yes, it was a miracle that this hundred-year-old man had a child. It was Isaac. I gave him Isaac. And then to Isaac, I gave Jacob and Esau. Later to Esau, I gave Mount Seir to take possession of it. And Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. Later on, I sent Moses and Aaron. And I went plaguing Egypt with what I did in its midst. And afterward, I brought you out. And when I was bringing your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea, then the Egyptians went chasing after your fathers with war chariots and with cavalrymen to the Red Sea. And they began to cry out to Jehovah. So he, Jehovah, placed a darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes got to see it what I did in Egypt. And you took up dwelling in the wilderness many days. Eventually I brought you to the land of the Amorites who were dwelling on the other side of the Jordan and they went fighting against you. And that I gave them into your hand. And you kept, you might say, that you might take possession of their land and I annihilated them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, got up and went fighting against Israel. And so he sent and summoned Balaam, the son of Beor, to call down evil upon you. And I did not listen to Balaam. Consequently, he blessed you repeatedly. Thus I delivered you out of his hand. Then you went crossing the Jordan, and you came to Jericho. And the landowners of Jericho, the Amorites and the Perizzites, and the Canaanites and the Hittites, and the Gergesites and the Hivites, and the Jebusites began fighting against you. But I gave them into your hand. So I sent the feeling of dejection ahead of you. And it gradually drove them out before you. Two kings of the Amorites, not with your sword, not with your bow. Thus I give you a land for which you have not toiled, and cities that you have not built, and you took up dwelling in them vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant are what you are eating. The result, the people were stirred to declare their resolve to serve Jehovah faithfully. Joshua 24, 14 to 17, verses 21 and 24. And now... Fear Jehovah and serve him in faultlessness and in truth. And remove the gods that your forefathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. And serve Jehovah. 
Now if it is bad in your eyes to serve Jehovah, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Whether the gods that your forefathers who were on the other side of the river served, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are dwelling. But as for me and my household, we shall serve Jehovah. And at this the people answered and said, It is unthinkable on our part to meet Jehovah so as to serve other gods. For it is Jehovah our God who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slaves, and who performed these great signs before our eyes, and who kept guarding us in all the way in which we walked and among all the peoples through the midst of whom we passed. In turn, the people said to Joshua, No! But to Jehovah we shall serve. In turn the people said to Joshua, Jehovah our God we shall serve, and to his voice we shall listen. This is given to us to see what Joshua did to help the children of Israel to count their blessings, to rehearse the history of God's organization made it come alive in their minds and hearts to show to them it's a reality. So often we find husbands and wives finding it hard to talk. Men are not great conversationalists, I bet. But women love to hear their Husbands talk to them. The husbands go in the garages and the attics and in the basement. And they, 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 they fear this sort of thing. And then one of the greatest blessings in the world is for a man to find a couch some night, sit next to his wife, and talk to her in his heart. How he feels religiously, really how he feels about his home, where he came from, his past, his history, how the truth affects him, what he thinks about Jehovah's organization. Sometimes he ought to talk to himself first because he may have some bad news about some of the elders. Then he ought to go into that closed room that Jesus talked about and talk to God about it, not to his wife. Because there are times when some of us have differences of opinion. But the truth is, there's a beautiful chance to become spiritual, to talk spiritual, and to reach into hearts and minds and find that we're real people with feelings and emotions, that we have love, we have concern for one another. It'd be good for a father to take his sons and his daughters and sit down and tell them a little bit about the past of Jehovah's organization. And tell them how he had to suffer. What it was like to have come into Jehovah's organization 40, 50, 60 years ago. Believe me, it's not like today. There were no kingdom hall. There was no backhauling. And there were no ways of... We went to town and horse and buggy. Believe me. I can hardly believe it, that men walk the moon today. But the truth is, in horse and buggies and horse and wagons, we traveled three and a half miles to our town, and there was no kingdom hall in our town. And if it's cold in the winter or so forth, we would go. But the truth is, coming into the organization was different than it is today. We met in this by and by. We met in houses, some of them were not come cheap and saw as far as what they looked like, some of these houses. And we met in cellars and in basements. We met in st storefront buildings. I see in my own mind's eye, after I had come to Bethel, being in Pennsylvania, crawling up some den, I would have been ashamed to invite people 
into this area. Today we wouldn't do that. Our third oldest here wouldn't tolerate the building like that. And the truth is, things have changed. When I was in Los Angeles down here and witnessed in Hollywood on Western Avenue and Sunset Boulevard, what do you think we met? We were in an odd fellow's hall. The place tanked with cigarette butts and cigars. It was no place to conduct the meeting. We went up there day after day. Down here in Long Beach, we had a place up on the first story on Atlantic Avenue. I remember that place. I was almost scared to go in that place. Not because of crime, but because there were so few people that were there. Oldies at best. I can tell you for sure, I think it was the first or second meeting I went there. The brother who conducted the Watchtower study came up to me and he said, would you write the questions for the Watchtower? Because there were no questions at that time. I didn't know A to Z about the truth. I hardly knew I was there, frankly. When I went down to San Pedro, I don't know, thank God I don't know the name of the street where the Kingdom Hall was, but it was a place where I first gave my first public talk. I gave it to the brothers. There were so few there, but I think I almost fainted <laughs> on the platform at the time. We had no theocratic ministry school. We had no instruction or, or teaching or anything of this nature. We were Greenhorns first class and all of the things. We've come a long, long, long way in teaching and instructing and loving our youth and helping them to grasp truths and understand and how to speak and how to enunciate and pronunciate and articulate language. And today I see young people coming on the platform and when they start talking, my goodness gracious, how beautifully they speak, beautifully proper. Sometimes even tears come to my eyes because I'm with the Bedford Stuyvesant Congregation, which is a Brooklyn ghetto. And God reaches down into the garbage to rescue these people. And these people come like beautiful flowers growing out of a garbage can. And we teach them the truth. And these kids that are absolutely nothing bombed out by every type of drug they be crack. Bedford Stuyvesant is called the crack capital of the world. And you ought to see our congregation, brothers. I'll boast of it because it's a, it's a beautiful congregation. <coughs> we have just renovated it. And we have no skilled old tradesmen in New York. I don't know how the people live. I don't dare tell you what I think. But the fact of the matter is, our tradesmen came from Pennsylvania and from Massachusetts and from all over, and they came and helped us build. But who did? Other, a lot of the menial work was done by our sisters. Our sisters went with pick and shovel and dug ditches for the sewer system. Why, when I came back, I was away for some time, and when they came back and saw the hall, it's a very very beautiful hall. Gorgeous hall. Last week, this time Sunday, I, did, I conducted the Watchtower study in it. It's not dedicated yet. One week from today it will be dedicated. And what a wonderful time we're going to have. But the fact is, at this Watchtower study, the brothers were so thrilled. People from all over come to look at this building because right in the center of a ghetto to see this lovely building come alive. Inside you see the glory of Jehovah in the, the spirit of God's organization. I don't think of the hundred plus people that were there 
I don't think their feet were touching the floor. <laughs> they were just living on a high. The conversation was deafening and it was beautiful to see. 30, 40 years ago, brothers, this was zinch. None of this. Children ought to know that. We ought to sit down to them and really make them cherish the sacrifices and the sweat, blood, and tears that brothers long before them were willing to give to cause organization, God's organization to flourish and to bring trade to the living God. It's something for us to think about. Today we have thousands and thousands of young people coming into the organization. It's something for us to see this. It's something to see what is happening on the face of the earth because of the great rebuilding program. To think that of all the engineering groups that we have on the face of the earth, the only thing you can think of that God is getting all things in position for the occupying of this globe of ours. Young, old, new, those who have been in the truth for many years, and those coming in the truth ought to get the feel of what a blessing it is to be a part of God's organization. To listen to the young ones speak sometime. I went to one place and I asked the young girl, she was there, a beautiful little child. I asked her whether she preferred radio to television. I was surprised to hear what she said. She says, radio. I said, radio? Why radio? She says, because the pictures are more beautiful. Isn't that precious? That she, in her own mind and imagination, listening, created pictures in her mind that were far more beautiful than what she saw on television. Our minds can envision things that can be far off matched by what the seeing eye can see. One girl had entered the museum, Metropolitan Museum of Art. She was out there with one of the brothers, and they were looking at Rodin's sculpture work, and they, she was looking at this thinker, you know where the man sits with his hand that way. And the girl said to the tour guide, do you think he's thinking about where he left his clothes? <laughs> I said, my, that could never come out of an adult mind. It's precious, the thoughts that come out of people the way they think. At 1st Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, writes there, This is fine and acceptable in the sight of our Savior God, whose will is, get a hold of that, whose will is, that all sorts of persons should be saved and come to an accurate knowledge of the truth. You can only see this in God's organization, and you can see it when you come to these international assemblies to see this great hodgepodge of humanity all flocking to come to listen, to get instruction. From all nationalities, kindreds, and tongues, no place else on the face of the earth do you see this. I was in Hong Kong, and they were, they were singing there, and I was standing next to a very beautiful Chinese girl, and she had a soprano voice. I had my recorder at the time, and I had it tuned to her, and she was singing the kingdom song so beautifully. My, I hope she'd never stop. But the truth is, after she stopped singing, and the meetings were dismissed, I asked her, what attracted her to the truth? 
And she looked at me as a great curiosity. She says, Brother, just because I look different doesn't mean I don't have a love for God. She says, when I looked into the Bible and I learned that God is going to make a paradise out of this earth, she says, all my life is that what is on, what I wanted. To live on earth forever in a better condition than what I see now. Chinese girl, lovely girl. And it's precious to see because about a year and a half, two years ago, we were in mainland China to see the interest of the people of native Chinese wanting to read the Bible, wanting to learn the Bible, literally flocked around us, engineers, doctors, and people's college students, and wanted to know how on earth could they get somebody to study with them about God and his kingdom. Really, it's surprising. I say when Jehovah removes the bamboo curtain, we will know how close to Armageddon we are. Because there are many, 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 many people down there who have a love of righteousness, who long to see the earth be filled with the knowledge of Jehovah, even as the waters cover the sea. The beautiful thing is that in the Chinese Bible, the name Jehovah occurs over 7,000 times. And he's called the higher than the highest one. And they have the name Jehovah there in their Bible. So it's no hardship to talk about God to those people. All over the earth we find this to be the truth. It's one of the greatest blessings today is to be able to express the truth. Not so long ago we were upstate New York visiting with Brother Giuliano down there. And he gave us of an experience of a professor who taught in the Cornell University. His subject of teaching was evolution and atheism. For 18 long years, this man, this was his Forte, teaching young people evolution and atheism. And then one day he woke up with spinal meningitis, completely lost all control of his body from his neck down. And while none of the doctors could help him, his wife stayed with him for a while, she left. The lawyers and the doctors took away his property and he lost, he became totally, totally disillusioned with life and he called on an organization. In fact, I didn't even know there was such an organization in existence. An organization that helps people to, uh, to commit suicide. Would you ever hear of a thing like that? They literally come into your home and teach you how you might kill yourself, take your life. He called in such a group, and they were coming in regularly, educating him and training him, conditioning his mind so he could take his life. Frankly, he said, on the last day, he was preparing the medicine to take, and they were to come in, and there was a doorbell that rang. He walked, he crawled over with the machine over, he had one of these electronic devices over there, and went to the door, and uh, it opened, and there were two sisters. He said they were Portuguese sisters. He could hardly understand what they had to say, but he said two things I understood. One is they talked of living forever. And the second thing he said, I saw in their faces something I didn't see in the faces of none of these people I've ever talked with. And that was hope, he said. And he said, whatever you have, I want. And frankly, they said, you just stay put, forget about this. And he told them that he was getting ready to take his life. And they said, forget about this. We're going to send you somebody who knows how to talk to people like you. And 
show you what God has in store for mankind. And surely as soon as they left, the other people came over. And he said, no, he says, I'm not prepared to go through with this. They said, what? We have spent all our time training and educating you. You cannot back up on us now. You've got to take your life. So he introduced them to the door. They left. And the brothers came and began to talk to him. He embraced the truth and is a marvelous man today. He's, I think they said he's an elder in the congregation. Frankly, he wrote, he was listening to a public talk that we give on Sundays, and uh, the talk had to deal with evolution and so forth. And he went up to the brother in his wheelchair, and he told the brother, Brother, you worked too hard on the subject. I've taught this for all my life, he said. I'm going to write you out something, he said. All you need to tell to really upset anybody with evolution and atheism. It, it doesn't have anything to stand on. And frankly, he gave me the, the sheet of paper that he wrote. I took it with me, and I hope to God that the writing department will someday publish it in our magazines for you to read. It's a brilliant argument in behalf of creation, is what it is. So it's beautiful to see people coming into the truth, feeling, reaching out, to hope, to aspirations of life, to think that truths of God have set people free. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, said Jesus. No more purgatory, no more evolution and atheism, and all sorts of superstitions and doctrines of demons go out of the window. And how grateful we should be because people are really tied into such things and they are afraid to break loose because they think they're going to be tormented eternally. But that is not the case. Isaiah 54, 13 tells us and all your sons will be taught by Jehovah and great will be the peace of your sons. Jesus said, this is was true, and so in now in our teaching, our educating, how grateful we should be, and what a blessing it is to be taught by Jehovah. We have been giving constant reminders by the slave class on morals, direction as on the use of blood, Bible principles on improper use of drugs and numerous other matters. First and foremost, a good relationship is with God. And however, experts are now acknowledging the hazards of some of the practices of blood transfusion. Dr. Harvey Klein of the U.S. National Institute of Health states AIDS has gotten all the publicity, but over the last 25 years, Really, the most important problem in blood transfusions is post-transfusion hepatitis. And even today, the major cause of death relative to blood transfusion is post-transfusion hepatitis. Professor Vincent Amaro Neto, a Brazilian expert on infectious diseases, says this, Quote, I often say that the best prevention for AIDS is for one to become one of Jehovah's Witnesses. For the member of that religion or the members of that religion are neither homosexuals or bisexuals. They are loyal to their marriage. They associate it with reproduction. They don't use drugs. And to complete the picture, they don't accept blood transfusions. Of course, there are other areas in which 
We are being instructed by Jehovah's organization today and are given direction, for example, in music. The January 15, 1983 Watchtower had the article, Modern Trends in Music, Can They Sway You? Like for these youngsters today that walk around with these things in their ears. Listen to the type of music today that is being marketed. The answer to the question is yes. Words reflecting demonistic thinking, conveying immoral lifestyles, can and do affect us. On page 10 of this article, there's food for thought here for every Christian, whether an elder in the congregation, a parent, a young person, or a child. Limitations of space prevent from presenting all available evidences regarding the degrading effects of some serious and modern music idioms. But every conscientious Christian would do well to examine his taste in music and also whatever record collections he may have and act in harmony with sound scriptural reasoning. And true to, in addition to the music, a lot of our young people today, and I say this because I work with young people in Brooklyn, a lot of them think they cannot have a good time unless they have alcohol. And they drink liquor to, to the point that they're stupid, but the New York state law states this, that it is absolutely unlawful for anyone to drink alcoholic beverages before he's 21 years of age, unless he's given the alcohol by his parents. So when they come to Bethel, we have to re-educate a lot of these young ones coming to Bethel as to what a good time it is and what a blessing might be for them. And it's amazing the changes that come over a lot of these young ones. A lot of them tell us for the first time in their lives, they feel that they're coming into the truth and that they appreciate Jehovah's organization. <laughs> Something's happening out there. Among you, brothers and sisters, you've got to be able to reach your children. Don't be afraid to get close to them if you possibly can. Love them. They are our heritage from Jehovah, according to the 127th Psalm there. Yes, so learn to love your children because life is involved. Associating with Jehovah's organization is one of the grand and beautiful blessings we have. We find that a lot of people don't know what it is to meet people, wholesome people, genuine people. I want to tell you about a woman that I've studied with, her name is Zimmerman, her son's buddy, he was in the U.S. Army in Germany. She had never, she, although she lived in Brooklyn, she had never but twice gone as far as Manhattan. All of her life, she lived around her one little home and the grocery store on the corner. You cannot think of a more close-minded person than this. The start of the Bible study with her. She was afraid to get out of her house, out of her house. A lot of people are afraid these days to get out of their houses in New York. But this was for another reason. She was just inhibited. And lo and behold, we introduced her to the book study arrangement then she went to the congregation and she didn't, she couldn't imagine that life could be so happy. But she said, you know, I could never, I could never go on a platform and talk like I see these sisters doing. But she got to do that too. She went on in service. Her son came from Germany when he saw this gigantic change in his mother. 
he wanted the truth too for himself. And lo and behold, he came in the truth, got in touch with an organization that had a business of all places in Afghanistan. And he asked his mother, Mom, he says, come with me to Afghanistan. <laughs> and she says, why not? <laughs> she says, we'll go there and witness to the Muslims. And for about 11 years, they were out there in Afghanistan. Can you think of a greater change from being a recluse in a home all these years? And then suddenly finding the breadth, the width, and the length, and the height of the earth, and of the universe, and finding in herself the potential to leave her home and her nation, and to go all the way of all places to Afghanistan, you see, and be faithful. And of course, the business wrapped up there, and they returned to New Jersey, where her son is still a very fine elder in Jehovah's organization. This is what we find in Jehovah's organization. When we come to the district conventions or circuit conventions, we hear talks given. There is one brother I've traveled for miles to hear him talk. He has the way to speak that really comes home to me. Beautiful man. I must say he's a black man too. He reaches the hearts. You can love him, get out of the seat and applaud him for the way he speaks to our brothers and the way he inculcates truth into the mind and heart and makes you love to be a witness of the Most High God. To have a man like that in organization is thrilling. To come to the circuit assemblies as we do, what a thrill it is. Sometimes I think the greatest thrill is to see how our brothers eat. I never thought they'd eat as if there's not going to be any food tomorrow. <laughs> they eat and eat with a gusto, and the conversations are deafening in the Brooklyn Assembly Hall. You can't hear yourself think when these brothers get together, you know. I hope there are full stomachs. Don't prevent them from listening after they get in the seat to kind of sprawl out, you see. I sometimes think we ought to have different kinds of chairs to keep people from relaxing too much in there. It's a thrill to see what is happening today in Jehovah's organization and to see the size and the way it's growing to think that every year for the last three years we've had over 300 plus thousand people flock in Jehovah's organization. Three years over a million people wanting to be one of Jehovah's witnesses. In fact, we have so many studies in some countries today that we don't have qualified people to study with them. That there are waiting lists for more than three months before a person can be studied with them. And it's not only in Russia, it's not only in Romania and Hungary, but it's also in Mexico and other places on the face of the earth is what we find in this. So we get not only direction and conversation and thoughts and inspiration, but we have a lot of other things. We get teaching and formal things to people, helping them with the truth. Not too long ago, I was in a doctor's office the brother that drove me there. We were building up a service meeting. And we had the service meeting and our discussion, we were talking right in the waiting room there about this woman not knowing that the name of God was Jehovah. So he and I were working this out. Two weeks later, I was back to the same office there, and a woman came up and introduced herself as Mary Elizabeth. But she said, I don't like to be called Mary because that's so closely touched with religion and I don't even want to be called Elizabeth, call me Liz. And that sort of struck me odd because she was a very sophisticated woman coming from Greenwich, Connecticut, but I mean where the biggies live. <laughs> and I said, well, I appreciate 
<clears throat> the fact that you want your name to be called a certain way, by said, is it something that a lot of people don't even know that God has a name? She says, yes. Two weeks ago, I was surprised to hear you talk with your friend, she said. I've been going to church all my life and didn't know that God had a name. She says, I went home that night and for the first time in my life, she says, I prayed to Jehovah God, she says. That really made, made sense to me. And she says, that same day, I called up my friend and she said, you ought to come to me when we come to see this doctor in this office. There are a couple of men over there that really know the Bible. She said this to her friend because the friend was reading the Jerusalem Bible. And sure enough, the friend did come and talk to us. I don't know what's going to be the outcome of a lot of this. A special pioneer witness, witness to a woman, a leader in the Presbyterian Church. She accepted the truth and started witnessing to the amazement of her former associates. These were way up in the Presbyterian Church. Her husband was to be the paramount chief in the area. But after listening to his wife, he refused to occupy the stool, which is the throne in the church. And it was offered to his nephew to accept. But the husband was also an elder in the Presbyterian Church and he became interested in the truth and started to attend the meetings at the Kingdom Hall. He sent a letter to the royal family to tell them of his stand that he had taken and he wrote a resignation letter to the Presbyterian Church and paid them off. The royal drummer beater also became interested in the truth and gave up his post and got baptized. And we're told that the royal family has been badly shaken and the present paramount chief was said to remark this young man that came to town is ruining the royal house. People coming and high stations into the truth. Frankly, of so many different people are coming to the truth to this day. If you ever get your index, look into it and see where what it says. Lawyers are coming to truth. Blind people, Hindus, people who love music, people who love to fly, who quit the church. Men who spoke about not being able to quit smoking have done so. Buddhists, Catholic nuns, communists, compulsive gamblers, diamond thieves, faith healers, fetish priestess, fortune tellers, guerrilla fighters, jealous husbands, atheists, evangelical ministers, Pentecostal preachers, voodoo practicers, raftists, Rastafarians, wish doctors, Hindus, a slave of demons, ancestor worshippers, Catholic priests, and on and on. It will show you in the index. All of these people coming into the truth. And as Paul says in Timothy, all sorts of persons coming into Jehovah's organization. I've often wondered whether a street person ever embraced the truth. And I spoke to several brothers at Bethel about this, and one brother invited me to come with him on his study. And down in South Brooklyn we came, one day was November, it was very cold I remember that day. We came to this house that was shaped like a castle because in Brooklyn, where many German Jewish barons lived at once upon a time, they built their houses to shape the type of houses they had on the Rhine. And there they were, but this house burned down and looked in shambles. But this brother took me down into the house, up the stairs, and there was a pile of rags out there. The place was cold, dingy, damp, because it was damp that day. 
And he says, I'm studying with a man that lives here. He's a street person. I said, I don't believe it. Yes. He said, wait a few minutes, you'll come. Hey, when I saw this man, I was, I was shaken, frankly, because he looked like somebody from another world. Long hair. Really not a dingy smelly. Just to look at his face, wrinkly, you know. His clothes tank. <laughs> and I wondered about the brother I was with. <laughs> really? It's all serious. <laughs> but he says, this man wants to learn the truth, Dad. Do you think I ought to study with him? And I said, if the spirit in you is such that moves you to want to study, study with him. Yes, this man studied for three months, and at the end of three months, came along so far that this brother took him into a house of a sister. She opened up her apartment house. He took him in, tore the clothes off of him because they were glued to his body, <laughs> and took him into the bathtub and poured the soaps and everything he had possibly could and scrubbed this man, clean shaved him and gave him a haircut and put a brand new suit on him and shoes that fit. He was a different person. And the sister opened up one of our bedrooms she had for this man. He studied in less than six months, became a marvelous man, not only in the book study, but at the watchtower. They began to wonder whether he was a circuit overseer or a district overseer because of the way he commented. He was a professor, a teacher in the university that allowed himself to go into the gutter and to become this way. He was so disappointed with life. The brother lifted him up with the word of God and gave him a hope to live, and he changed his life on him. And today he's one of our pioneers in Brooklyn. Faithful pioneer. Isn't that beautiful, brothers? To seek the truth of God and that truth of Personally, my money backed away, and sometimes I'm ashamed of thinking of that way. But these things are not done by power or by might, but they are by my spirit. And we ought to really cherish such a people within Jehovah's organization that are motivated by spirit, who can really stoop to conquer, get people to embrace God's organization in the way of life. Yes, Proverbs 28, 20 says, a man of faithful acts will get many blessings and the blessings of Jehovah, that is what makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with them. So, brothers, cherish and recount Jehovah's blessing in your life. Count your blessings, and they will help sustain you amid a joyless world. Remember, it is good to give thanks to your God, Jehovah, to make melody to his great name. He who is the Most High. Know that God cares for you. Know that we, we in Jehovah's organization love you. And we love you dearly. God loves you. And to the extent that you apply yourself, brothers, and that you count your blessings, may this great God of ours, Jehovah, bless you all richly. Thank you.